The media and entertainment industry has experienced significant cross-border investment and cooperation over the last few years. However, the 19th Party Congress report classifies the entertainment industry as a restricted industry, and the Chinese government is clamping down on foreign investment in the sector and is looking closer to home for money. Our panelists will address what opportunities there are for new types of cooperation, investment strategies, and partnerships, and also discuss the challenges that lie ahead. They will also talk about lessons learned and share their observations on future areas of innovation and collaboration. And we are delighted to welcome the following speakers to this panel, which include two UCLA Anderson alumni, Dan Goldman, founder and CEO at OnZone's On Media Network, Hao Ling, senior board executive at Alibaba Cloud, Jason Miller, class of 2012, senior vice president of Talent International and Emerging Market at Live Nation. This panel will be moderated by John Neerman, class of 1995, who built his entertainment career of over 25 years with the Walt Disney's company and electronic arts. Prior to starting his own media companies, Far West Entertainment in 2010 and Loop Media in 2016. He has served in top management roles in bridging the US and Asia for each of these companies and achieved success in both the business and creative sides of multinational, regional, corporate, and international business units. And then later entered the entrepreneurial world with his own companies. He spent many years living in Hong Kong, Singapore, Shanghai, and Tokyo. Please join us in welcoming our speakers and panelists. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we appreciate all the efforts that's been put into the conference. So we're going to dive into this. Uh, we have a great panel today, um, a lot of different perspectives. When you kind of look across the board of media, entertainment, technology, content, we'll cover a little of, of each of those. Um, we've got a big Western corporate company that uh, a lot of, you know, kind of pushing across the globe. We've got a Chinese company uh, that is pushing this way, and yet Howe's actually quite interesting because he's kind of got this little entrepreneurial unit within a big company. Um, and then we've got the entrepreneur, Dan, who is building it from scratch and, and has a lot of stories about that. Uh, so it's exciting to kind of talk through each of these. So I would like each of you, if you don't mind, because you know you're better than me, you know yourselves, uh, to maybe take a few minutes Talk a little bit about your background, careers, and then we'll get into that. Jason, all you. Sure. So uh, I was born and raised in New York, moved out here to California uh, 25 years ago. I did my undergrad in uh, upstate New York, Syracuse University specifically. And my first role when I came out here was at Creative Artist Agency, representing talent. So uh, I represented, during my 11 years there, people ranging from Beyonce to Jimmy Fallon, uh, Maroon 5, et cetera. Uh, then I spent six years on my own, running my own company. And then the last five, I've been working at Live Nation. So for those that don't know Live Nation, we are the largest concert promoter in the world. We do about 30,000 concerts a year. I think that works out to one every 10 minutes or so. <laughs> uh, we also are the parent company for Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster last year sold half a billion tickets. They are also the largest ticketing company in the world, also one of the largest e-commerce sites in the world. So at Live Nation, uh, I oversee the talent buying, essentially the tour producing for uh, the Asia region, obviously China as well. Uh, recent tours for us in Asia have included Madonna, Coldplay. Um, I've actually got Bruno Mars in Shanghai for the next three nights, three sold out shows there, uh, purely coincidental. Uh, and hopefully lots more in the future. That's great. And Bruno, I, I love the timing. Yeah. And here you are, you couldn't be there with him. That's, that's, no, gotta, well, that's, that's a little painful. Yeah, we're doing, actually the Bruno tour, the interesting thing about the Bruno tour, it's probably the most extensive tour of Asia by a Western act ever. Uh, he's doing 
19 shows in virtually every major market in Asia, which is a pretty, you wouldn't think that's unusual, but it's pretty unusual for a Western act to do that many cities and that many shows. It's true. We're going to dive into a little bit of some of the challenges, some of the uh, opportunities uh, of bringing artists that way and vice versa, because that's not exactly, you know, easy as well, kind of going both ways. Hal? Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. My name is Hal Lin, and uh, uh, let's see, I think my introduction is going to be much less uh, interesting compared <laughs> to John's. Very fun uh, company and very fun role uh, to be in. Uh, I was born and raised in Taiwan. Uh, I uh, came to California about 21 years ago. I went to undergrad uh, at UC Davis. Another UC. All right, all right. <laughs> Same uh, colors, right? Aren't they, aren't they all blue and gold? No, blue and yellow, yeah, some different way. Enough. I'll be quiet. I'll yeah. just be quiet. Yeah, Never yeah. mind. Uh, let's see. I've uh, uh, spent the last 15 years of my career in uh, sales and business development for uh, high, high technology companies. Um, uh, the last 10 was uh, with uh, Oracle. Again, uh, you know, kind of boring company right now. But mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, uh, just under the last year, I said over the last 10 months, I, I have been with Alibaba Cloud. And uh, my job is to uh, help Alibaba Cloud expand to the Americas market. Uh, so, you know, I spend most of my, my days flying, frankly. And, uh, you know, I come across a lot of different type of uh, people and customers. You know, I work with some of the largest enterprises in the world. Uh, I was meeting with a country yesterday. And here I am with you guys at UCLA. <laughs> so uh, it's, a, it's a fun journey, and uh, I, uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Appreciate that. Dan? So it's going to be really hard to measure up to Jason and Bruno Mars and <laughs> Beyonce and all that. You know, nothing hot like that. But um, I, I founded the company. My background is in technology. So I founded the company in uh, 2009 in Seattle. And the core idea was to create this next generation, um, you know, digital, over the top streaming company that would aggregate, um, <clears throat> as you guys know, everybody's streaming everything right now. And so in 2009, my idea was that, you know, uh, in the future, there would be an explosion of digital streaming channels. And I wanted to aggregate, you know, as many of them as possible into one site, offer them on a monthly subscription basis, no ads, and available across all platforms. So it's essentially what Amazon is doing today, right? Very, very successfully. But, you know, that was in 2009 and I didn't have the Amazon brand name and definitely not the Amazon money. Um, so uh, it was also a time when streaming was fairly new and a lot of the VCs that I'd go to for funding would say, um, you know, streaming's a fad. It's not really gonna take off, right? It's hard to believe that now, but that really was the case. So I was trying to, you know, um, <clears throat> start up a company and, and develop a company that was content with no funding and no content because the content world also didn't really get what I was trying to do. Um, you know, every meeting in Hollywood would go extremely well. Nobody says no in Hollywood. Uh, <laughs> and I'd get all excited and go home and think something magic was going to happen. But, you know, of course, nothing would ever happen because everybody's looking for a billion dollar check, right? So. Um, you know, I've got lots of stories. One of the most interesting stories um, that I can remember when I um, went to Hollywood, it was right after Netflix had come, had come to town and had written literally a billion dollar check to license content, right? So I came right after and I was asking for content and I didn't have the billion dollar check, so I kind of walked away with nothing, right? Um, in the process, uh, we did end up, um, you know, working with various news organizations that were the only ones amenable to, you know, experimenting. For a couple hundred bucks a month, you'd get access to all their content and do whatever you want. They just wanted to see if something works. Um, as I was uh, working with all that content, at one point we had about five million content pieces on our system that we were trying to manage. So when the volume is so large, you either have to have an army of people you know, doing stuff or you have to have a high degree of uh, sophistication and automation. So we ended up developing a very sophisticated system that today has revolutionized the digital content supply chain. It's all in the cloud. Um, it does things like um, you know, determine the, the 
the quality of your content, and if it's not good enough, it automatically fixes it. And I'll talk about some of the more sophisticated things that we do. Um, and then, you know, we developed our own um, digital distribution technology, as in, you know, we can allow you know, major brands that we work with um, to create streaming video on demand services, and we power them. So that's kind of what we do today. We um, are uh, a very disruptive company when it comes to the digital content supply chain. We do stuff on the te digital technology um, or distribution technology, but then we also do stuff on, you know, uh, on the content side as well. So over the years, we've developed content, we've produced content, we've launched various channels, we've, we're powering digital channels across the globe. So we have a very interesting, unique um, position in that we're not just content, but we're technology, sort of this hybrid, and we see you know, both sides of things. Um, so that's it. That's great. So you know, you, the, we're going to touch on the entrepreneurial aspect as well. And you feel free to talk about those six years if, the, you, know, if you want to dive into that when you're starting your own thing. Yeah. Um, but just to set a little context, and those of you that were here all day, we had uh, Dr. William Wu talk about the economic overview. Um, and Dean Olean kind of talking about how 77, there was a billion in trade, and now we're up to 636, something like that. Is that about right? But when, when I first went to Asia 20 years ago, um, China really wasn't mentioned beyond manufacturing. Uh, I went out with Disney, and, and in fact, Disney as a brand, well, I don't think, you know, so it's like we talked about this, English Disney, I'm walking around. I don't know if people really got it, but the mouse ears, they got that. It was like a Mickey Mouse. Okay, I got that. So the growth of even just 10 years ago, uh, 10 years ago in terms of media landscape in China, companies like Tencent, Alibaba, were, were brand new. They're just kind of growing and coming out. And now they've, been, well, 15 years ago, but now they've become some of the biggest in Asia, if not globally. Um, conversely, you know, companies here like Amazon, Google, uh, those guys were trying to make it in China, right? It was kind of that period where Amazon was failing in China, Google was getting locked out, Facebook was getting locked out. So that's all kind of a long-winded thing is bringing to today. As the landscape has changed, how important is China in your business today? And for how, I think we could need to reverse it. How important is the US and other parts of the world for Alibaba? So um, Jason, why don't you tee it up? So, you know, 20 years ago when I was in the agency business, I remember China sort of opened up to, to Western music uh, in a big way. And everyone really thought, wow, you know, they got a billion plus people over there. <laughs> Give it 10 years and can you imagine how many shows our artists would be performing in China? Um, you know, we'll end up doing more shows in China than we do in the United States, for sure. And the reality of that today, 20 years later, is it's probably harder for me to do business in China today than it was 20 years ago. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So harder in the sense of the restrictions. Do you feel like because of all the social media, all the platforms, uh, this again goes to maybe a security issue, the clampdown that was mentioned, is that what makes it harder? Yeah, or? I mean, there's a, look, there's a number, I think, I think 20 years ago, the, the Chinese government probably wasn't quite as focused. It wasn't something they were particularly aware of, right. whereas now they're hyper aware of it. So uh, the implications, I, I assume the implications of what an artist could say in a live setting um, worries the government. <laughs> So that makes what, that's just one of the reasons that makes doing business in China really difficult, right? Because it's, it's, it's difficult to control artists by nature. That's just not. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> Good luck with that, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's a long-winded way of saying China, of course, is important. I'm not sure who in business it couldn't be important to right. if they're doing business over, over borders. The problem is there's a lot of challenges, and so it's, I, I wish it was more important for us, but it's so challenging that it's, it's tough to invest as much time as we probably wish we could. Do you feel like Japan has somehow gotten lost in the shuffle? Because again, maybe 20 years ago, or I don't know, 15, 
movies would premiere, if they were going to go anywhere in Asia, it was Tokyo. Uh -huh. And then maybe Singapore, because that covered kind of Southeast Asia. And, uh, but now, everybody wants to go to China. I mean, uh -huh. Japan clear, clearly is still a huge market. Is that correct for you as well? Uh, yeah, it is. It's, well, it's a, it's a huge music market. It's a relatively small international music market. So international music in Japan is about 10% of the market, right. if that. So all eyes on China. All eyes, yeah, all eyes on China, in a, and certainly in a big way. Um, and the mo if things opened up more, uh, I, think, I think you would see artists want to go to China. Like, that's the good news for me, yeah. is that our clients all want to go. Um, <laughs> executing their wishes is, is a difficult proposition on, on a whole variety of levels. And sort of permitting is just one. It starts there, but there's a bunch after that as well. Yeah, I want to follow up with you later on the logistics and the challenges in that. But Dan, as a, as a smaller company, kind of the startup, and you're looking for business where you could get it from the sense, but you also, you launch as a global company. Uh, how important is it for you? Well, it's very important. I mean, we are, um, you know, uh, our, internally we kind of joke that we're the best kept secret in Hollywood, right? Um, we work with, you know, every major studio in town, um, but also internationally as well. China remains, you know, for us uh, a target, you know, a, a wish, and obviously, like Jason said, I don't know of any any company that um, is not looking into you know doing something in China. However, um, and I would say before I even go there, you know, um, our our studio, our content partners, our customers um, are always asking about launching services, streaming services to China in, in China. But you know, the same I think similar challenges that that Jason just mentioned. I think we face the same um, you know challenges as well. I mean, there's. Uh, the need to uh, sort of find a partner in China that can help you on the ground. And for us, it would mean, um, for instance, you know, content distribution networks, you know, platform companies, um, business affairs, et cetera, et cetera. I think the legalities, the compliance-related issues make it very, very complex. And um, until, for us as a company, um, until we get a little bit more stable, uh, more I, sh I should say mature as a company, you have a uh, you know, massive amount of resources, it, it just remains a, a target. Um, but it's, there is a demand and we see a lot of requests coming in for you know, the software services that we provide. There's definitely demand coming in from China. We, at this point, we're not able to service you know, the, the requests that come in, both you know, from China and then on behalf of our US-based customers. So in a way, it's not a bad problem because you're so busy, you are getting uh, quite a bit of business and traction, as we've talked about with your company. So that's that's terrific. So, on your way, and then as you expand, you know you'll have those people on the ground um, out there soon. So, okay, how other way perspective? You've got Alibaba trying to get a foothold in the U.S. You've got the behemoths over here. You've got to deal with. Uh, what's that like in terms of a priority for you? So that's a, that's a very interesting question. And I think, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a part of my answer is also going to come back to your question for Jason and Dan. Uh, you know, yes, this is an extremely challenging market for us, uh, you know, because uh, you got the, the, the different cultural issue and, and, and you got the fact that we're a Chinese company issue. But I think uh, a larger part of the problem is that, you know, this happens to be where our competitors are strongest. And, it just happens to be where uh, you know we are the newest. So uh, there are multiple level of challenges uh, that we're dealing with, uh, which is why you know we are uh, being very strategic uh, in what we do uh, in the way we go about acquiring business. You know, there are uh, every one of us, and this is a very small team here in the U.S., but every one of us, uh, you know works like a madman, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, I, 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 was, I was joking with you earlier, you know, I spend a ton of my time on the plane, um, you know, going to different uh, business meetings uh, with a variety of different type of customers. Uh, and a, a large part of that discussion, which goes back to your first uh, question to the two gentlemen here, is how we help a US-based company get into China. So I think some of you might be familiar with uh, you know, our co-founder Jack Ma 
uh, our founder, Jack Ma, and uh, you know, he was here in the North America twice in 2017, uh, uh, and he hosted two events, one in Detroit and one in Toronto, called Gateway. And I think that's really what we are selling. You know, Alibaba Group is the gateway for people that want to sell things into China. And Alibaba Cloud is a gateway for businesses like yourself, you know, that require cloud infrastructure uh, to enter the China market. Right. Right. So Alibaba, Alibaba Cloud, your competitors in the U.S. would be? Would be the, I mean, the big ones, right? The AWSs, the Azures, and the Google. Okay. So Amazon. Um, do you, so it's interesting, you know, we often look at it from a perspective of Western company going to China, obviously, because that's where a lot of us are coming from. Um, and you sometimes feel the squeeze there, but do you feel that squeeze here? Do you feel like these guys don't want you on their playing field? We do, it depends on the day. <laughs> Fridays are okay. <laughs> it, it truly depends on the day. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, you don't feel as much, and sometimes you do. Uh, but I think how how I how I keep waking up every day in the morning, uh, you know, under the challenging environment is, uh, you know, to stay true to my mission, which is, you know, we provide a value to people. So you think about it. You talk about how how big China uh, China is for. Live Nation and for Dan's company, right? Uh, you know, McKinsey did a did a, uh, a survey or not a survey, a re report last year, saying that by 2025, every dollar spent in the world, 50% will come from China, mm. right? Uh, yeah. China uh, currently has 300 million people that's considered middle class, and that is, you know, from what you would consider a third world country just 10, 15 years ago. So, you know, you're you're dealing with you know, a, a very large population that are relatively young that are looking for the premium products, the premium experiences. Right. Right. And that's why every company in the world that is selling anything to consumers, China is by far the number one market in the next 10, 15 years. So is it difficult to do business in China? Are there challenges? Certainly. And, and I do too here. But that's what my company does, is we are the platforms. So we have a cloud platform for your business, and we have a media entertainment platform for your business. Right. Synergy, man. Look at that. This panel is all about synergy. Business Everybody working together. together. I love it. Um, 20 minutes. Look at Wow, the drinks, are they on ice? <laughs> I better start moving a little bit here. Wow. I want to keep quoting the other speakers just to prove that I paid attention earlier. So. Dr. Wu uh, also commented, Chinese technology improved dramatically the past 10 years, and their national security concerns limit some M&A. Um, this is about technology trends. So I want to talk a little bit about technological trends, content trends, uh, as it was related to media and entertainment. Um, Dan, we're going to give Jason a break. He doesn't have to answer the first one. <laughs> but you're a technologist. So, I mean, you, you are definitely an expert in, ter in terms of technology. Um, what do you see in terms of these trends that are happening that are really kind of blending content, delivery, and a lot of that is, and I'll just speak one more point from the gaming industry, um, the online games really kind of started out there with Korea and China, so they are leading in many areas. But what do you see in terms of the trends? Well, I think as it relates to you know, media and entertainment, I think the big uh, shift, um, we're all aware of it, is this whole you know, broadcast to digital you know, trend. Um, and you know, then, you know, not just digital, but we're talking about mobile. You know, we were having a chat as we were preparing for this panel, um, the extent of which you know, mobile has penetrated in, in China, right? Um, it's just... It's just amazing, right? Um, in the U.S., you know, of course, mobile um, devices roll, especially when it comes to, to you know, um, younger millennials, Gen Zers. I mean, in, uh, you know, my one of my daughters uh, sits in her room all day, wrapped in a burrito, like a burrito <laughs> in, in her blanket, 
and just, you know, can watch for hours and hours on a small device and, and not get tired of it, you know. So, you know, uh, all of these trends, of course, the, the you know, broadcast to digital, uh, digital, and then, of course, mobile, um, you know, introduces all kinds of complexities when it, when it comes to technology. Because um, as we're working with, you know, some of the biggest names in media and entertainment, I think the, the challenge is, is how, to, number one, the, you, we're sitting on a boatload of content that's been developed, you know, using uh, ancient technologies, uh, you know, relatively speaking. And, of course, for, you know, the consumption on um, older devices. So, you know, you've got the problem of getting that content that's sitting around and, and you know, you're talking about a massive amount, a uh, hundred years or so worth of content. So how do you get that content retrofitted and working on all these newer devices and more specifically on like a multitude, millions of, of, of devices? It could be anything, right? How can you take that and make it happen? And then of course, you know, for next gen stuff, um, as it relates to content, uh, you know, given these trends that I just talked about, um, you know, how does content uh, shift? You know, it's not just the, you know, the long form content and stuff that you used to work in the past. Um, younger generation, mobile devices, all these things introduce a new type of formula in terms of the type of content that, you know, people want to see. You know, so it's not just, you know, from a technology perspective, making that content work on these devices. It's, there's a whole new formula to producing content that, you know, this younger generation wants to consume. And that, you know, of course applies to China, I think more so than any other country that I've seen. Um, and so, you know, our, our company is right in the, in the middle of that in that we've developed, and when I said we are a disruptor, we've developed a platform that can take, you know, a mass amount of content, ingest it, um, run it through an automated Q, uh, quality control process, understand the problems, and in most cases fix the problems, and, you know, retrofit it automatically for all these new screens, all these new types of devices um, that we have available to us. Um, and so not only that, but once you have it in, you know, in, within our infrastructure in the cloud, and usually the cloud can be you know, your cloud, it can be AWS cloud, whatever cloud you know, our customers prefer, uh, with a, a couple clicks of the button, we can you know, get all that mass amount of content distributed on any type of platform by just selecting the content, uh, select the destination, click submit, and it just happens in the background. You know, so these are extreme complexities that the trends that we're talking about, you know, are, have introduced and, you know, there are solutions in the market and we happen to be a leading solutions provider for that. So we see all kinds of interesting scenarios, but by and large, I mean, I'm just staying at a high level, this is what we see. Great. How, how does that relate to what you're seeing? I mean, is it similar? I would say, uh, you know, part of uh, what Dan is seeing, I'm certainly seeing as well, uh, you know, with uh, just a pure amount of content that, uh, you know, is becoming available. So think about it, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you had the major studios making content primarily, right? Now, you know, uh, for the market of China, and, and frankly, this applies to the rest of the world too, I mean, uh, the biggest content generator are the individuals doing live streaming, right? So all of a sudden, you have the explosion of the content in, in the variety and the volume uh, that uh, traditional uh, method and traditional infrastructure, uh, you know, uh, cannot keep up, right? So, you know, uh, we certainly see, and, you know, Alibaba Cloud uh, is working to support the media and entertainment business for Alibaba Group to uh, deploy AI and machine learning technologies uh, for a variety of different purposes, right? Uh, one of which, uh, which I think is interesting, and, I, and we so spoke about before, is you know going through the the literally a hundred years of footage, uh, you know, of sporting events, and identifying you know different actions uh, that are happening. Uh, for example, uh, like a triple axel in in figure skating, and and indexing them you know by the frame, and allowing consumers. Uh, to really get to the exact frame that they're looking for at a point in time with a, with a particular athlete, right? Because I think this generation, we're all ADDs. Yeah. Right? Right? We, I mean, the reason why we have DVRs is because we want to be able to skip to exactly where we want to be. And then I think the next generation uh, is even pickier than that. It's even more demanding than that, 
right? So, so I certainly think uh, the, the AI uh, mm -hmm. technology is coming into play big time. And you, Dan, you're, sorry, Jason, don't worry. I'm coming right <laughs> back at you. Um, the AI component for you too, you also have that working for compliance. You talked about an interesting example. Can you share kind of how you utilize that? Yeah, you know, for for us, um, you know, the solution that we provide, um, all the, the stuff that I was just talking about, it, it, we view it as the basics. You know, the the future, and I think where the value um, comes into play for uh, anybody that's a content owner is around, you know, ROI, and of course, you know, uh, making sure that you're doing this in a manner that that makes sense and it's cost efficient, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where AI really can come into play. And, and you know shorten the cycle in many ways and do all these things that mass amounts of humans would have to do. Um, and so we've all seen probably the articles about Netflix and how they have an army of people that sit uh, in rooms all day and just watch movies and just tag movies and with all possible you know, permutations and combinations, et cetera, et cetera. Well, all that, you know, uh, to me, is something that AI can pick up and do very, very easily. So for us, a very practical scenario is when we have, um, you know, our uh, customers come to us and say, all right, I need to get these, you know, 10,000, 100,000 films into China or into Turkey, for instance. And I was just telling John, you know, the other day that I found out last week that, for instance, in Turkey, um, you know, uh, having somebody smoking on screen is bad, not good. You're not going to get your stuff in there. So, so what do you do? Um, you can either have somebody watch there and uh, watch the entire film and edit all the smoking films, or you can, you know, run it through our AI system. Our AI system will then, you know, uh, scan it, flag all the smoking scenes, and, and send it to an operator that can look at it and then edit it. You know, at this point, it's, there's still some manual intervention that has to happen, but the amount of time is greatly you know, shortened you know, versus what was happening before. We see a future where AI continues to increase in terms of you know, the stuff that it can do and to the point where you know, um, all this stuff will be 100% done by AI and the human interaction will not be required. But this is a very a a practical application of, of AI technology that can scan you know, specific footage, you know, um, highlight or you know bring to the attention of an operator specific scenes that are banned and then you know create recipes of a film that can then be automatically distributed into China and to Turkey wherever else it requires so it's it's kind of an exciting for us that that as a as a nerd as a techie that's what really gets me going <laughs> you could just go on and I on I can go on and could. on all day yeah we're going to be replaced by AI no more panels soon, in the Wu conference yeah. <laughs> so all right, Jason. So you you deal with the most exciting, scary, I don't know, sometimes unpredictable aspects of entertainment uh, and content live. Yeah. So what are you seeing in terms of trends for your business? Well, I'm certainly not tech savvy. Uh, I leave that to these guys. Um, I, I think for us, as it relates to China specifically, what we've started doing uh, recently that we had not in previous years was streaming uh, live events mm -hmm. into China. That seems to be a uh, easier path to the finish line because while, while it's technically a live event, the reality is there is a five second delay, which I think uh, government officials like. That's right. So um, Ward, Wardrobe malfunction. That's right. Mentioned. Well, yeah, all sorts of things can yeah. go wrong. So. Uh, so we did that last year. We had Coldplay touring Asia, and actually we streamed uh, their Los Angeles show here at the Rose Bowl into China. And that ended up being the most watched uh, live music stream ever in China. Uh, so it was a fantastic result, um, and I think we'll continue to do a bit more of it. Do you, so one little uh, interesting stat that I recently discovered that you would know. 23 of the top 25 videos on YouTube of all time are music videos. Mm -hmm. So a ton of people clearly watch this. Um, you mentioned live streaming. Not only China, but it feels like there's so many companies even here in the US that are getting the rights to the festival in Brazil or Coachella or whatever and then kind of, so is this a, big, a bigger part of your business? The streaming, the digital aspect? Can you monetize that more? 
um, or is that just kind of a smaller component? Uh, are you speaking about China specifically or globally? It's whatever's easier to answer. I mean, look, for our, the way that Live Nation has set up our, there is no festival division per se. Each festival is sort of owned and operated locally. Uh, and those festivals then sell their streaming rights to whomever they choose uh, to do so. Uh, it's certainly very popular. Uh, it's certainly additional revenue in the festival space. Uh, in, a, in a space where the margins for profit are very low. So, uh, so it's certainly growing, and I think just for us in Asia, as I mentioned, the unique challenges of trying to get artists into China, streaming is just easier. All right, so we're gonna pivot perfect look segue right into challenges, uh, and then we'll follow that up with opportunities. But everybody has a story, you know, in terms of doing business in China, um, the challenge with that. Uh, but before I really dive into that, the aspect of bringing Chinese artists west, is that trend, we obviously know about K-pop, and I don't, in fact, K-pop a few years ago was really going, is it still, still going up there, okay. Yep. What about China, has China taken any of that pie uh, in terms of their artist? Uh, the, the domestic Chinese artists, I would say, do have some uh, ability to tour internationally. It's fairly limited. Uh, we did, I worked on a tour a couple of years ago, actually the largest, um, essentially the largest rock, Asian rock band is a, is a band called Mayday, which I'm guessing you've probably heard of. They're from Taiwan, Taiwan. they speak, yeah. they speak uh, Mandarin. Uh, and we, we, you know, I did seven shows in North America, including uh, a sold out Madison Square Garden. So there's certainly- That's pretty cool. Yeah, there's certainly an audience for it. Yeah, did anybody see Mayday here? Yeah, they, they played here like, at the sports arena. See, look at, yeah, yeah, look, look at, at all right, there we go. Wow. Bring them on over. <laughs> bring them on. Jason will be taking requests for uh, <laughs> groups to bring over from China afterwards. Be sure to corner them down here. Um, anyway, challenges. How, in terms of what you're facing, challenges? Uh... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll again <laughs> go back to the, the question you asked, uh, Jason, you know, I think. Yeah. Uh, typically, and let me just be clear, this is pretty much all I do. I, I talk to, uh, you know, the large U.S.-based multinational companies, and I help them with their China operation. That's one of the, the things that we're getting a lot of traction on. You got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. And uh, you know, I think China is a different market. I, I, certainly, there are rules and regulations that are different, and and I don't claim to know more than Jason. You've had experience, so I, you know, that's a. I think that's a very telling on. Uh, just the, the type of environment uh, that China is. But I think even, uh, you know, technologically, you know, with, uh, you know, the fact that China is very mobile-centric, we talked about this earlier, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Dan pointed that out earlier. Let, let me tell you how mobile-centric it is. Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, there's a manufacturer holiday, uh, shopping holiday called Singles Day in China, which is very similar to the Black Friday here. And you know, last year, uh, you know, single state on Alibaba's platform did $25 billion on that day, 90% of which was on mobile. Uh, in China, the most popular wallet is a cell phone case with a slot for an ID. Mm. Because you don't need anything else when you go out. Uh, you can you know, pay everything uh, with your mobile phone. You know, just knowing the, the different ins and outs of how to operate in China and knowing sort of the, the, the advantages and, and the shortcomings of the infrastructure that it offers, I think it's, uh, it's key. Great. All right. Dan? Well, I, don't know if there's much, I don't know if there's much I can, I can add to all that. I think, as I said at the beginning, you know, China remains and is you know, a uh, very, very attractive market for anybody in the content space. I and mean, when you're talking about, I believe, like 600 million uh, broadband users, um, you know, an enormous economy, it's always going to be attractive. You know, the challenge is, you know, uh, getting in there, like I said, finding the right partner. And it looks like I just found one. Yeah, there you, know? you go. So, <laughs> so um, I think it's, it's well covered, and I can't really compete with Jason. So. My name is Michael Similian. And I work for Intel up in the Bay Area. And as, you, as uh, most of you know, uh, it, our technology powers the cloud. And so my question for uh, Hao Lin is, 
uh, do you find that um, convincing uh, U.S. enterprises to use a cloud service that's based out of China is a concern for security of their data and their information? That's a great question, and that's something I get asked every time. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm very used to addressing it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think when I deal with these kind of inquiries, I like to stick to the facts. I think uh, perception certainly is our biggest challenge uh, in this country. The fact is, Alibaba is a New York Stock Exchange company. Uh, the fact is, uh, Alibaba Cloud has PwC as a third-party auditor uh, to, audit, to audit the data center operations uh, you know, around the world. Uh, and the fact is, uh, we operate our data centers in each region based on local law. Uh, you know, so, and, and that we're not, uh, we don't have a connection with uh, uh, the Chinese government uh, that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> or that you're willing to say. Yeah. One or the other. See, once again, now they're loosening them up. <laughs> so, so I think, I think uh, you know, I, like I mentioned earlier, I deal with some of the largest enterprises in the world and uh, everyone has their security standards and usually when they uh, look at our uh, audit done by TPWC, which is a report that's 250 pages, uh, they either are convinced or it's too much for them to read. <laughs> either way, uh, I've never had an issue to get past uh, the security concern. Now, I'll add to that, I think uh, every time somebody needs you, they try to make it work. Uh, and I do feel like we offer a very unique, uh, we offer uh, these companies a very unique uh, value proposition, uh, you know, that they are willing to be more objective than if we didn't have it. Does that answer your question? It does, yeah, it's a great answer. Thanks. Thank you. He was prepared for that question. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well read, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'm assuming security for you just means like giant guys with bright yellow jackets <laughs> keeping people away from the stage. Uh, is, there, is, there, is there a technical <laughs> anything else? Uh, so, so look, from a safety perspective, uh, China, for us, relative to the rest of Asia, is, uh, well, Asia in general, look, is arguably one of the safer areas of the world, right, right? in terms of terrorism, that right, sort of right. thing. Um, so in China in particular, right, it's real hard to get a gun in China. Yeah. Um, so, so from that perspective, um, artists really have no, no issues going to China. I think um, the international standards when it comes to um, production, and safety uh, and operations are a little different over there, and that can be one of the challenges we face when teaming up with a local partner um, in terms of what they are willing and able to provide versus what a international artist is used to getting elsewhere in the world. Dan, do you have anything on security you want to add, any component? Well, I think, you know, the, the security that we're worried about is really around, you know, digital rights management, you know, music, film, entertainment type of content. So, you know, anything going in and out of our, you know, platform and into any, you know, geographic location around the world has to have that security. So the concern is, is really around, you know, um, IP theft, right? And right. Uh, I don't think any, anybody, any one of our, you know, customers or partners wants their stuff out on the internet for free. So, you know, there's a lot of work that we do. It's, it's, it's multi-layered, multi-pronged type of, of an approach when it comes to content security. And I think there is no silver bullet. And ultimately, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that when it comes to security, if uh, you give somebody long enough time, you know, and, you know, enough resources, they're going to find a way around, you know, most security measures, you know. But um, I think the secret is, and the answer when it comes to content security is to, you know, take a multi-pronged, multi-layer approach um, and, you know, hope to God that, you know, you're safe. But, you know, software inherently as a technologist is not secure, no matter what anybody says, right? 
So, um, you know, there's a lot of challenges when it comes to, to security, and that's a whole, you know, panel or discussion or seminar, you know, for another time. <laughs> but we worry about that. It's, it's core, it's central to what we do. Um, I had uh, committed to keeping us on track, so I want to ask you a final question. And Jason, you talked about this earlier. That is it easier or is it harder? You know, what, all of these advances, has it made it easier or harder to do business? All of this competition, um, the ability to really become global. So when you're looking at, because the topic is US and China, is it easy or is it harder today than it was five, 10 years ago? Very vague, very broad. I, I mean, I think it's, it remains, for us it remains hard. It's a, it's a, it's a real challenge, there are unique problems uh, and challenges for doing uh, what we do all over Asia. Um, but the, ch the, the challenges that I have in Japan are totally different than the challenges I have in China or that I have in Indonesia, for example. So um, that's what keeps my job interesting, uh, is playing with all those challenges simultaneously. Uh, I, I would I'd hope uh, that it gets easier. I'm not holding my breath. Next big concert in Shanghai, do we know yet? Bruno Mars tomorrow Bruno's night. Bruno's tomorrow night, everybody. Tomorrow Live night. stream. You, you could fly out there and be there for the Monday That's show. That's true. Great. Actually, there are a couple tickets left for the Macau show. Right. So wow. if anyone wants to go, it's the only show in Asia that's not sold out at the moment. But Venetian? We're like this close. Is it the Venetian? It is at the Venetian. All right, there we go. Okay, so well, go. put in the request. Time to get there. Yeah, exactly. How, what about you? I mean, in terms of, you've kind of seen it from both the Western company, Oracle, and now you're with the Chinese company. Um, What's it been like for you? Easier or harder now? I, I think it's certainly easier, uh, you know, from a, a technology perspective. And, and you think about it, you know, so many of the, the, the big enterprises are so dependent on technology, you know. So uh, with the advances of uh, cloud computing, uh, you can, you know, set up shop in China tomorrow if you wanted to. Uh, and, uh, you know, instead of having to go buy servers uh, and the advancement of AI, Mm -hmm. Also helps you, uh, you know, deal with a lot of the things that you, nor you otherwise would need human beings for, which also is uh, something that you can leverage for the market if you weren't local over there, right? So I, I certainly think, you know, holistically, if you look at business t uh, today versus business 20 years ago, it's uh, much easier for uh, somebody to be a multinational company to be in China. And Dan, I know we didn't really get to dive into the entrepreneurial journey, but uh, that's certainly not easy. Uh, but you've kind of weathered the storm of six or seven years to now be at a, at a place where you're at that exciting part of your business. So not assuming your answer is easier, but uh, what is your perspective on that based where your business is now? I think on a technological level, I have to agree with how, you know, um, it's, it's easier than ever, you know, and, and honestly, uh, technology is sort of a, a universal language, you know. Uh, we inherently, as humans, understand and appreciate technology. And so, from that perspective, I find it to be easier when it comes to, you know, content, you know, stuff like concerts and, you know, you know th things like that. Um, it really depends on the region. Uh, China, of course, there's all the challenges that we know about, but it's not just China, I think in general, when it comes to content, any type of content at all, it just, you know, it's a whole different conversation because there's, you know, uh, the sensitivities to local politics and, um, you know, the whatever's going on in, in you know, uh, various regions across the globe. But in general, I would say that the world is smaller than ever. I think technology brings it, you know, together and, and we find ourselves being able to conduct business easier um, than ever and, and do things like, you know, we, we're often on uh, web, you know, conference calls, viewing what's going on on, on some person's desk halfway ac across the globe. And that includes China these days for us as well. So um, I guess, you know, from a technological perspective, for us it's easier. Content remains challenging, but that's always been the case and I don't see that changing because it's, uh, it's heavily tied to what's going on on a regional basis. All right. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Uh, very insightful uh, information. Thank you, everybody.